The following recording is a presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Rohnert Park, California, and of Pastor Val Mark Smith. We are an independent Baptist congregation committed to the accurate presentation of the historical doctrines of the faith. We welcome you to visit our services anytime here in the Rohnert Park area. Now, if you'd open your Bibles then to Mark chapter 3, today is another Sunday in the book of Mark, and we will be here for quite some time, although I might sprinkle in some other sermons as we go just to give you just a little bit of a break. But last week we started a study of the 12 apostles, and I hope uh, you find that to be an interesting subject. I do. It's in the Word of God, so I think it uh, is something we ought to look at and think about is what God has called us to do by looking at what called them to do. So the subject then is Christ's selection of his apostles. It is their call to the ministry. Jesus gathered these men and he separated them from all the others that were following and gave them a special commission to continue his ministry after his crucifixion and resurrection. Their ministry was specialized. Their calling was unlike any other because the position of an apostle was over at the end of the first century. So we don't have apostles today. That's one thing that makes their calling so special. And we noticed how different they were and how they are remembered. Not only do we look back to the apostles and read about them in the past by seeing these things that we'll talk about today, but we've also seen how they will be memorialized in the future in the foundations of the walls of the new Jerusalem. And then also that they are appointed as judges over the tribes of Israel in Christ's millennial kingdom. And that kingdom of, is decidedly Jewish, which shows us that God still has a plan and purpose for the nation of Israel. Now remember, this is their call to apostleship. Their call to salvation was a divine selection, but that happened previously when they were converted. And as they travel with Jesus throughout Galilee, they were preaching and watched him preach, watched him heal people from many diseases. And stunningly, they saw the power of Christ, the supernatural power over nature as he calmed the sea. We come to that just a little bit later in the Gospel of Mark. Then they watched him heal so many people. They watched him with power over the spiritual world as he cast out demons. Well, this then was a period of training for the apostles. And really this whole thing, I think, is to capture their attention so that there's no doubt in their minds by seeing all these things that Jesus did, he truly is the Messiah. He is the Savior of the world. And they bore witness to all that he did and they would become witnesses to others around them. And by their witness, we still have the gospel today. All right. Again, Christ truly was the Messiah, and he had his own mission in mind. He didn't intend to stay on this earth for a long period, but his mission was to go to the cross. We'll read that in just a few minutes, but it was to go to the cross. He set his face to go to Jerusalem, to go to the cross, to be crucified for sin, and then to be raised from the dead. After that, he would return and did return to his place in heaven. So that ministry was brief, but his compassion... For the souls of people is long. He, he is concerned about whether people are going to die and go to heaven or die and go to hell. This is why he has his apostles out preaching the word. And then one day he will return as the King of kings and Lord of lords to receive his people unto himself. Now his purpose then in calling these men is to send them out. They are called apostles, one, ones sent to tell the world that salvation has come. Salvation is through the gospel of Christ. And so these men were called to preach the gospel. Now we find them here in chapter 3 as Christ gave them power to do many of the miracles that he did. They were given power to heal and cast out demons. And as they recognized the power of Christ that validated him, so others would validate the mission of the apostles by the special works of that they could do. Their main mission, though, is not to heal. It was not to heal. It was not to cast out demons. No, they were to preach the gospel. Miracles at that time were incidental. 
to the preaching of the gospel. That is not the call for the apostles. Now we look then at Mark chapter 3. We'll read these verses once again, beginning in verse number 13. And he goeth up into a mountain and calleth unto him whom he would, and they came unto him. And he ordained twelve that they should be with him, and that he might send them forth to preach, and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out devils. And Simon, he surnamed Peter, and James the son of Zebedee, and John the brother of James, and he surnamed them Boanerges, which is the sons of thunder. And Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Canaanite, and Judas Iscariot, which also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Now my intention in this series of sermons on the apostles is to tell you more about these men that Christ chose. Not much is said about some of them, and so that leaves us going somewhat into the area of conjecture. Some of this we get by what I call reading in the white spaces between verses. Some of it comes from tradition. But I want you to understand that it isn't my intention to make things up. Uh, The Bible is too valuable in the things that we can know than to spend our time in things that we can't know. But that doesn't prevent us from uh, searching and looking for other things that may be written about this and what some opinions that people have and what passes down to us as tradition. But I'm not going to be dogmatic about anything. It's not directly said to us in chapter and verse in the scriptures. So I will say, again, we're not prevented from some types of speculation. If it's not contrary to scripture, it helps us to uh, paint a picture, maybe a mental picture of the character of these men, then we may include what is likely, but maybe not certainly known. And I'll make those distinctions as we go along. These men were diverse in their background, somewhat diverse. I can tell you before Jesus trained them that if we looked at them today, none of them would be on our list of ministerial candidates. They just don't seem to fit. But after the Holy Spirit got hold of their souls, they became the foundational building blocks of Christ's church. And when I get to heaven, first person I want to see, obviously, is Jesus. And we won't be able to miss him. Uh, I'll I'll mention this, that uh, some of these books that are written where people say, I died and I went to heaven and I came back and this is what I saw. Rarely do they ever mention that they saw Christ. How do you get to heaven and not see Christ? So he's the the light of the place. Well, we'll see him, but I'm very interested in meeting people that are in the Bible. The apostles are some of the men that I want to meet. Of course, those in the Old Testament as well. I look forward to that. But we see that Jesus chose these men. They were the building blocks of his church. Um, Jesus didn't choose the worldly wise. We read that in 1 Corinthians a moment ago. These weren't highly educated men. They weren't noble, not famous. In fact, some of them were infamous. And they had to be retooled by Christ before they could be used in God's service. So Christ had to change them. These men are more fit into the category that Paul defined there in 1 Corinthians 1, where he says, For you see your calling, brethren, have it not many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God hath chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God hath chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And we would have to say that these fellows certainly did confound the wise and the mighty. The learned rulers couldn't understand, how do these guys know all this stuff? How do they know so much about the Bible and interpreting that? And and how do they do the miracles that they do? And they come down to only one conclusion. They do this because they have been with Jesus. And that's always the strength that we have. It comes down to this. We do what we do because we have been with Jesus. So as we study these men, we are reminded that none of us has what it takes to work in God's kingdom. None of us is qualified. We're all misfits for God's work. And so what God does, he takes people like us and he changes us into people that he can use. These are men that needed to be strong, who wouldn't break under the pressures of persecution. They must continue to preach no matter what the difficulty. 
If you remember last week, I said that they're, they're part of this unbreakable chain. If that chain breaks in the very first link, then it never does get to us. So these men had to be strong, and they were by the power of the Holy Spirit. And the point of studying these men is to show you that God can do things with people like them, and thus he can do it with people like us. They were faulty men. Jesus did not choose them for their perfection. They were mortals. Even though what we tend to do is to look up to them and they're much larger than life to us, they're called saints, and they were. But no more saints than any person in this room who believes in Jesus Christ. They weren't beatified, canonized, sanitized, or anything else. Uh, they had their faults. When Jesus chose them, they had their faults afterwards. They were chosen for gospel work, highly specialized gospel work, but that doesn't mean that we aren't also called for gospel work. For 2,000 years, this is what's gone on. Men and women have been strong in the faith. The gospel reaches us today because of that faithfulness. But there is a question for each of us here, and that is, will the next generation know what we know? And they won't unless we tell them. And that's the work of the church to do. Now, I want to pick up where we left off last time. Uh, we left off with Peter, who is the most prominent of the apostles. He rose to the top as the leader. Uh, although, I want you to understand this, that Peter was not above any of the apostles as a prelate. Uh, he appears first in the list of disciples, but he's not first in power and authority. None of them is first in power and authority. There's much more information about Peter than the others, and most of last week's sermon was about him. Now, just briefly to, to refresh you on that, Peter we called the impetuous leader. Peter's the most prominent of the disciples. He's always mentioned first in the list because he was the leader. Now, we notice in verse number 16 it says, And Simon, he surnamed Peter. Jesus named him Peter. We talked about the significance of this name Peter, which means a rock, but it means a small rock. And there's confusion that reigns over the interpretation of Matthew 16, 18 because of the word rock that Jesus uses in that verse and also speaking to Peter. The verse says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Now the rock that Jesus built the church on was not Peter. It is Christ himself who is that solid rock. Peter wasn't given any more power and authority than the other apostles. He just became the spokesman for the group. You could say that Peter was a type A personality. No matter what kind of a group that you put him in, Peter would somehow make his way into leadership. In his fishing business, I have no doubt, Peter's the one who made out the schedule and said, this is where we're going to fish today. And everybody went where Peter said to go. Well, there is more information in that first sermon, but I want to move on now to uh, speak of other, uh, the three other disciples that were part of this first group of four. Now, I mentioned last time that uh, there are three groups of four disciples and the four that are always mentioned first are Peter, James, John, and Andrew. So we're going to look now at the second of the disciples in that list, James. James, who we might call the passionate apostle. James was the brother of John. Their father's name was Zebedee. We don't find much in Scripture about James, uh, but he was one of the group that was closest to Jesus. Peter, James, and John were the closest. Andrew is just a, a little bit further out. And there are several times in Scripture where just these three, Peter, James, and John, were with Jesus when the other disciples were not. These were the only disciples that were permitted to go with Jesus up on the Mount of Transfiguration. They alone saw a glimpse of Jesus, uh, what he may appear to be in his glory. They, these are the only Ones who saw those two Old Testament prophets that had long since gone, Moses and Elijah, on that mount. James was close with Jesus, but like the others, he was a rough character. He, he was a fisherman, just like Peter and Andrew. He and his brother John were partners 
with them in the fishing business. They weren't recreational fishermen, they were businessmen, and business must have been pretty good for them. Uh, Zebedee, their father, was also in the business too, and, and they were successful enough that they were able to hire employees, helpers, to uh, help them in that fishing business. You can read about that in Mark chapter 1, verse number 20. James and John were the sons of Zebedee, but Jesus gave them another name. He called them sons of thunder. We don't know for sure why Jesus gave them that name, but we might have a clue in Luke chapter 9 that reports their strange method of evangelism. Now let's turn there for just a minute to read that story. Luke chapter 9, Jesus was ready to go to Jerusalem. Uh, he was going there for the crucifixion, and he sent his disciples into Samaria as an advance party to gather provisions for the trip, and the Samaritans didn't like Jews, and Jews don't like Samaritans. So Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, the holy city at Passover time, and the Samaritans didn't think very much of that because they had their own special place of worship that was holy to them, and that was Mount Gerizim. So it appeared that Jesus just disregarded their worship, and so they weren't too keen on helping him. And we look at Luke 9, beginning verse 51, And it came to pass, when the time was come, that he should be received up, he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem, and sent messengers before his face, and they went and entered into a village of the Samaritans to make ready for him. And they did not receive him, because his face was as though he would go to Jerusalem. When his disciples, James and John, saw this, they said, Lord, wilt thou that we command fire to come down from heaven and consume them, even as Elias did? But he turned and rebuked them and said, Ye know not what manner of spirit ye are of, for the Son of Man is not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. And they went to another village. Well, this is a great method of evangelism. If people don't like the gospel, call down fire from heaven and destroy them. Uh, this is called angry evangelism. And I suppose there are times when we might like to try that. Uh, James and John were sons of thunder because maybe at times their wild passion was uncontrollable. You ever felt that way? You ever get angry when somebody disagrees with you, perhaps over scripture, when you're you know, talking with them about things in the Bible, people that don't believe like you. you know, I sometimes can get riled up by that. I try not to, but I can get riled up if I see two Mormons riding down the street on bicycles and uh, a Jehovah Witness passing out the watchtower in the neighborhood. They're deceivers, and you're not to let them in because when you try to, well, we'll talk about that in just a second, but if you do let them in, and you try to convert them, you know how frustrating it can be. They're very, very difficult people to deal with. I mean, they've been twice baked in their cultish religion, so they're difficult. But have you ever secretly hoped that as they're riding the bicycle down the street, they hit the curb and go flying over the handlebars? You ever felt like that? If you do, you have a little bit of the sons of thunder in you, uh, if that's what you think. But that's James and John. And in a moment... We'll see how Jesus had to curb that attitude and channel their enthusiasm in a different direction. Then there's also that incident, we've, we've talked about this a couple times, of James and John, when they sparked a little bit of rivalry between the disciples, um, they asked Jesus if they could be essentially chiefs in the kingdom, one sitting on one side of Jesus and the other on the other side of Jesus. And who knows, they may have been afraid, afraid that well, if we don't do this, Peter is surely to do it. He's going to jump out in front of us. So let's just go ask Jesus if we can have these spots in the kingdom. Now, the last incident, though, that I want to talk to you about is James' death. We don't have a record in the Bible of the way that any of the apostles died except James and Judas Iscariot. With Peter, we rely on tradition. With, with Andrew, rely on tradition and some of the others. So let's go to Acts chapter 12. And in this chapter, Herod Agrippa, a wicked ruler who was the grandson of Herod the Great, was anxious to get rid of Christians and especially the leaders. And there's this one guy who must have been a real, must really have been a thorn in his side because he was the first apostle that was singled out to be killed for his faith. In the 12th chapter of Acts, verses 1 to 3, 
Now about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Now you think about this, loud, boisterous Peter, he's a good catch. But James must have been causing many problems too, because he's the one that Herod grabbed first. James must have been thundering about out about Herod and his sins and all the stuff that he was doing and plaguing the religious Jews. And they were just pleased as punch that Herod got hold of him and killed him. And this was an ignominious end to James as the world sees it because, you know, people were thrilled. Thrilled that he died. I don't think we want to be remembered that way. Good, good, he's dead. You know, people go you know, witness a... a uh, execution at uh, a prison where they're going to give someone the needle and when they do that people stand back and they cry for someone who's murdered other people and the liberals cry and they shed all their tears over the unfairness of capital punishment and all of that not James they were happy you know you don't usually send execution cards to an execution but this is what they did we're so happy that Herod killed James, and so Herod saw, well, that, that pleased them, and it says he also took Peter and put him in prison. We won't read that story today, but uh, that's a pretty interesting thing that happened there, too. So Herod killed James with the sword. He was the first apostle martyred. Judas died earlier, but that was because of a suicide. He wasn't a true believing apostle anyway. So James is the first one who was killed for his faith. How was he killed? Well, it says that he was killed with a sword. That means that they beheaded him. He wouldn't stop preaching. And so to the delight of the Jews, Herod had him decapitated. This brings us to the third disciple, which is John. John is the apostle of love. Now, we know much more about John than we do James, but his attitude at the beginning was much like James because he's the other half of that Sons of Thunder. He was a partner in the fishing business with, with his brother, Peter and Andrew as well. Uh, and he was one of the first two disciples that recognized Jesus as the Messiah. The other is Andrew. James never wrote any books in the New Testament. We don't have any sermons that James preached, but it's different with his brother John. John wrote the Gospel of John. That tells us about Christ's life. If you let me just read in the 20th chapter of John where... He gave a reason for the gospel accounts that he wrote. And take note that this is not on your listening sheet, so if you want to write it down, you might want to do that. This was added after we printed those. John 20, verse 30, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written, that ye might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing ye might have life through his name. And there you get, a, you get an idea, a picture of the main endeavor of John's life. He wrote all this down. He recorded this so that people would believe and they would have eternal life. Not only the Gospel of John, but John wrote 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. Then he wrote the last book of the Bible, the Revelation. Uh, James was the first apostle to die for his faith. John was the last apostle to die and the only one of them as far as we know that wasn't martyred john was remarkably transformed after he was trained by christ he was transformed from that son of thunder who wanted to rain down fire on people who didn't believe but he was changed from that to be known as the apostle of love his writings are filled with love. He wrote of God's love for the world, John 3:16. He wrote of God's love for his own son. He was like Christ in his love for the and care of God's people. He wrote of love that Christians must have for each other. But as we think about John's writings about love and being a man of love, he is totally misunderstood about love. He's probably the most misunderstood apostle that we read about. Uh, he didn't promote this syrupy, milky, sentimental love that he's given credit for. John is always pictured as a long-haired, dopey, droopy-eyed, effeminate character that looks like he spent all day painting, planting flowers. Let me give you a picture 
you could show us that one. This is, this is the way John is used. This is Leonardo da Vinci's picture of John. And you have to ask yourself, is that John? Or is that Joanna? I'm not, not really sure about that. Uh, but that's not... He was a man. John was a man's man, I do believe. John was not a flower child. He understood God's love. No, no offense to anybody here who's a flower child. Uh, he understood Christ's bloody, sacrificial love. He understood that God loved his own before the world began. He understood God's wrathful condemnation upon sinners. John loved the gospel. But he stands out as one, not that he's the only one, but you read him, especially in the epistles, and he stands out one as one who hated the false gospels. He hated that kind of stuff. I mean, you did not want to be a Mormon and show up on John's doorstep. He wrote in 2 John that if someone comes to your house with a false gospel, don't let them in. And don't wish them good luck as they head back down the sidewalk. You know, as I usually say when we come to this subject, turn the sprinklers on and spray them down with the water hose. Discourage them any way that you can. I know that's a little bit of exaggeration, but there's no missing that what John did was to call those who didn't preach a right gospel liars, and he called them antichrists. It's clear from reading 1 John, he has no patience for a false gospel. Polycarp, who was a disciple John knew him personally, told the story of John being in a Roman bathhouse when Serinthius, a teacher of docetism, and don't worry about that, you can ask me about it later, but uh, Serinthius, a teacher of docetism, came into the bathhouse. And when John saw him, John immediately ran out because he didn't want the bathhouse to fall on him and kill them both while he was in there. Most people don't think that about heretics. They're willing to go along with it, you know, suffer it, it's okay, allow all that stuff. Um, they want to include Mormons and Jehovah Witnesses in the Christian faith, but that's not John. He made a very clear distinction about who are true believers in Jesus Christ. He had no patience for sacramentarians either. And that doesn't mean people from Sacramento. <laughs> Although that could be a subject for a later sermon maybe. But sacramentarians are those who believe in uh, keeping sacraments for salvation, whether it's baptism, whether it's the Mass or penance and things like that. John stood against all of that. He didn't like sacerdotalism. That means having a priest stand between you and God to represent you before God. He wouldn't stand for any of that. So he, he was a man that stood strong on the true gospel of Jesus Christ. Just simply, he doesn't like, he didn't like false gospels. He wouldn't put up with it. So if you argue against the deity of Christ, as Mormons do, if you argue for any other salvation other than justification by faith alone, then you don't expect lovely John, friendly John, the loving John, to pat you on the head and say, that's okay, you just believe what you want to believe. It's all all right, we're all going to the same place anyway. No, he tells you you're going to a place, but not the same place that he's going. Now here's another interesting note about John. And by the way, he, he becomes a son of thunder again with the false gospel. But here's another interesting note about him. If you turn to John chapter 20 uh, and look at a few verses, there's a peculiar way that John refers to himself in his writings. He never mentions his name in any of the books that he wrote except the Revelation. Now John 20 is a good example of this. I read the last part of the chapter a few minutes ago. Look at the first part of John 20, verse number 1. The first day of the week... Come with Mary Magdalene early, when it was yet dark, under the sepulchre, and see at the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth, and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved, and saith unto them, They have taken away the Lord out of the sepulchre, and we know not where they have laid him. Peter therefore went forth, and that other disciple, and came to the sepulchre. So they ran both together, and the other disciple did outrun Peter and came first to the sepulcher. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen clothes lying, yet went he not in. Then cometh Simon Peter following him and went into the sepulcher and see it the linen clothes lie, and the napkin that was about his head, not lying with the linen clothes, but wrapped together in a place by itself. Then went in also that other disciple, 
which came first to the sepulcher, and he saw and believed. Now in verse number two, John refers to himself as the other disciple whom Jesus loved. In verse number three, he is that other disciple. In verse eight, he is that other disciple. The entire Gospel of John is filled with these kinds of references. Throughout the entire Gospel of John, he never mentions his own name. In John 13, 23, now there was leaning on Jesus' bosom one of his disciples whom Jesus loved. John 21, verse 7, Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved saith unto Peter, It is the Lord. John wrote this about 50 or 60 years after he became a Christian. And do you notice what time had done to him? Those 50 or 60 years had made him a different man. Do you see how he acts differently than he did before. He started out with his brother James with a call down fire from heaven type of evangelism. He was right there with James asking to be prominent in Christ's kingdom, desiring to sit next to the throne and sitting in that high position. Everybody would know his name. You wouldn't have to ask. Everybody would know that must be John. But in the end of his life, he had no desires, no such desires, he was so humble that he wrote the entire gospel account in the third person, never giving his name. Now, why would John do that? Well, I think it's because, I, I think I know that it's because he believed that Christ is everything. He believed that Christ deserves all glory. He didn't need to be prominent, didn't need to stand out that way. He was lovingly devoted to the Lord and to the Lord's people. And how different that is from today's Christianity. Uh, every, every time that there is a, um, a squabble among Christians, it's because somebody wants to be first. I deserve my rights. I don't deserve to be treated this way. And selfish desire is always the fuel for church arguments. So you know what happened to John? What did he deserve? Well, surely a man that loved people, a man that became so kind and gentle, surely a man like that deserves a statue, something. Be carried on silk pillows, maybe, treated with kid gloves. But John never demanded his rights. He never even told about this terrible event that happened at the end of his life. Many scholars believe that John was boiled in oil. They tried to kill him, but he didn't die. And so in lieu of that, grossly disfigured and probably scarred in a very scary sight, they exiled him to a rocky, barren island called Patmos, where he was given the revelation. At one time, John was the pastor of the great Ephesian church. But no more. There he is on the Isle of Patmos, willing to die there for Christ as an old man. So while he was there, God gave him the revelation. Earlier, Christ allowed him to come up on the Mount of Transfiguration, where he saw that glimpse of the glory of Christ. And now in the end of his life, a faithful disciple who loved the Lord and his people, who never desired anything for himself, ends up writing Revelation 19, seeing the Son of God come to this earth on a white horse as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Amazing, amazing. What a man John was. He died at about 100 years old, faithful to the very end. And I think, maybe for some, John may very well be the favorite apostle. Now this leaves us one other apostle for today's message. Number four is Andrew. And we'll call Andrew the go-getter. Andrew was Peter's brother, and from the same hometown as Peter. That's Bethsaida on the northwestern shore of the Sea of Galilee. And at the time that Jesus began his ministry, both he and Peter were living in a Capernaum, uh, it was Peter's house that Jesus went into and where he healed Peter's mother-in-law. Andrew was originally a disciple of John the Baptist, which tells us that he was a godly man. If you remember, John preached the, the gospel of repentance, and he demanded that people would show evidence that they had repented of sin. So if Andrew had done that, then he proved that he was a godly man because John, uh, John the Baptist didn't baptize any others except those who could show they had repented. And of course, John the Baptist preached to people about the ministry of Jesus. And so 
in, in John chapter 1, John pointed to Jesus and he said that John the Baptist pointed to Jesus and said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. Now two of his disciples heard him say that. One was John, the son of Zebedee, and the other was Andrew. And when they heard the announcement, John the Baptist lost two disciples because both John and Andrew believed and they began to follow Jesus. Now, th this very exciting part of this is what Andrew did next. We read about this in John chapter 1. John chapter 1 and verse number 40. One of the two which heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He first findeth his own brother Simon and saith unto him, We have found the Messiah, which is being interpreted the Christ. And he brought him to Jesus. Andrew's greatest desire upon becoming a Christian was to let others know who Jesus is so they could believe him too. Becoming a Christian meant that he couldn't keep this secret. And as the people of God, this is not something that we keep secret. It's going to show in us if we are true believers in Jesus Christ. There must be this desire to tell others or the gospel fails to reach anyone. And, and an interesting thing about Andrew is that in telling others, he is not what we would say was an out front disciple, not trying to take any leadership roles or trying to be someone special other than what Christ called him to be a witness for him. There are no sermons in the Bible that Andrew preached. Now, I'm sure that he did preach, but the biblical record of his life is not about preaching. Instead, the biblical record of Andrew is of the ordinary Christian doing ordinary things that ordinary Christians ought to do. And that is, tell people about Jesus. That's what Andrew did. Tell others about Christ. That's the desire. So he did, which shows that you don't have to be a great preacher. You don't have to have sermons that are recorded on the internet. You don't have to have books written or anything like that. You don't have to do any of that to be a witness for Jesus Christ. You can do great things for God just as an ordinary Christian doing what ordinary Christians ought to do. So you may not be the one that stands in the pulpit, may not be a powerful preacher, but you know somebody at some time had to talk to Jonathan Edwards about the gospel. Somebody at some time had to talk to George Whitfield about the gospel of Christ. Somebody had to tell Charles Spurgeon. You know, the story of Spurgeon is that he actually came to the Lord in a small Methodist church while he was out walking around down the streets and heard the gospel there. And then somebody had to tell had to tell um, Dwight Moody about how to be saved. And all of these men become great soul winners for the Lord. Andrew's more one in the shadows. He brought Peter to Jesus. And what a mighty preacher that Peter was. Andrew knew his brother well. He, he knew if Peter became a follower, it wouldn't be long before he would rise to leadership. And what, what happened to Andrew? Andrew would remain in the shadows, known mostly as... Peter's brother. Peter gets the attention. He's just known as Peter's brother. So his claim to fame or his lack thereof is he's Peter's brother. Well, this means that Andrew had to be willing to take a back seat. Probably done that all of his life. Peter's that standout guy. Everybody recognizes Peter. Poor old Andrew seems never to be recognized. The most important part, though, was getting Peter to Jesus. And we think about how many souls were won to Christ because Andrew brought Peter to Jesus. Peter preached that message on Pentecost where 3,000 people were saved in one day. Did you know that 3,000 are also credited to Andrew's account? He receives a reward for that as well because he brought Peter to Jesus. And this is the reason that it's really important for you to always be ready to speak about your faith. You might think, well, I'm just a very, very insignificant piece of the puzzle. But the truth is, the puzzle doesn't look quite right unless that one little piece is there. I know my wife got into 
putting a puzzle together. I think she had one that was a thousand or fifteen hundred pieces. And um, she was looking for all these pieces. I refused practically to help, because that drives me crazy. And uh, one piece didn't show up. So she bought a second puzzle of the same thing so she could find that extra piece that was missing. And because the picture just doesn't look right if it's got a piece missing. And that's the way it is with us. Things just aren't quite right. They aren't quite right in the church if part of the pieces of our puzzle is missing. So we want to work together for the cause of Christ. Now here's another thought found in the conversion of Andrew. John chapter 1 verse 41 says, We have found the Messiah which being interpreted the Christ. John Butler writes, Here an exclamation point needs to be inserted after Andrew's, We have found the Messiah. The great hope of the Jews was wrapped up in the coming of the Messiah. Therefore, to say that one had found the Messiah could only be said with great enthusiasm. It was exclamatory news. For millenniums, Israel had looked and waited for the Messiah. Now he's here. Andrew had spent much of one day in the presence of Jesus Christ, and the experience had greatly inspired and thrilled him. Is that your reaction upon coming to Christ? Are you thrilled with the fact that you found, or he found you, I should say, that Jesus found you? Are you thrilled to recognize that Jesus is the Savior? Andrew's the kind of guy that brought people to Jesus. He, he found the little boy that had two fish and five loaves of bread, and that became one of the greatest miracles that Jesus performed. That's one recorded in all four gospel accounts. Andrew was an apostle. He was sent with authority to preach Christ, to heal, to cast out demons. He could do it. The Bible doesn't tell us how Andrew died, but tradition says that he was martyred for his faith. So eventually this great witness who brought people to Jesus was silence. It's said that Andrew was crucified on a cross made like an X. And that's why an X is the symbol for Andrew. And why Elon Musk has an X, I don't know, but it's not the same reason as Andrew. Andrew is the patron saint of Scotland. And you say, well, what does that mean? The patron saint, saint of Scotland. It means absolutely nothing. Nothing at all. Andrew's been named the patron saint of fishmongers, those people who have gout, singers, people with sore throats, spinsters, maidens, old maids, women who want to become mothers. I don't think the apostles need symbols. I don't think so. They never asked for worship, for statues. They never asked for symbols. They never asked to be patron saints of anything. They only preach Christ, not them. So there are always and only saints of Christ. Andrew stands in the background. Let Jesus shine. Let me show people Jesus. Let, let him do the heavy lifting. I tell them he does the saving. And it's that way with all of us. Simply tell it, then leave the rest of it up to our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So what kind of people does God use? Well, he used Peter, a bossy loudmouth. I don't recommend you do that part, but he used Peter. You know, he was a guy that stood up and took charge. That's okay, I suppose. Um, he took charge. God uses those kinds of people. He uses people that whose hero, like James, was Elijah, who called down fire from heaven, used those kinds of people who want to destroy people who are not true worshipers. I'm just kind of joking about that because we could change from that too. Uh, but he uses those kinds of people. He twitches their personalities around. He also used John, a son of thunder, who gave up his lighter, and, and uh, he was teachable, and he became the apostle of love. Friends, those four that we've just talked about are just like us. They were misfits for God's kingdom until Christ got hold of them and changed them. They're just four guys out here that have a fishing boat. Four guys with a fishing boat. Just four ordinary guys with no claim to fame. But they believed in Jesus and he called them and converted them and commissioned them. And he made them fishers of men. They're famous now only because of Jesus. We wouldn't know anything about them at all if not for Jesus. Do you think you'd brag if you personally knew Jesus? I mean, in the flesh. 
You, you, you know, he's my friend. I'll just, would you brag about that? Probably would. Would you want to be next to him in a stained glass window? I don't know. They wouldn't want to be the patron saint of anything. They would be horrified that someone would make a statue of them. They only desire that the name of Christ would be exalted and his name preached to the ends of the earth. And I hope that's what we want to do. We're all sinners saved by the grace of God. Let's just keep on keeping on with the great commission and be fishers of men. Blessed be God for the preeminence of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come to you now thanking you for your word. What we learn about these four men who were called by you, changed by you, and then became these great apostles of the church. Certainly, again, not great for who they were because they were just fishermen, but great because of what you made of them. And yet, in changing their hearts, you didn't make them so they wanted to outshine you. So, Lord, we just pray that you would help us in our calling for Jesus Christ to be like them, to hide behind the cross, let you shine, give you all the glory, and just simply let know, let people know that you died for sinners and that all those who put their faith and their trust in you can be saved from their sins. That's all that we need to do and then let you take care of it from there. Well, we put everything into your hands. We thank you for your mercy and grace. We thank you for saving us and helping us, calling us to be a part of this church where we can learn the word of God and learn to be the witnesses we should be. Bless our people. We thank you, Lord, for each and every one. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you for listening to this presentation of the Brian Baptist Church of Roner Park, California. If you would like further information about our church, please feel free to call us at area code 707-584-7275 or write to us at Brian Baptist Church, 6298 Country Club Drive, Roner Park, California. 94928. Additionally, you may visit us online at www.bebaptist.org.